All right, good afternoon. This is the Wednesday, September 29th meeting of the Design and Project Review Committee. I'm Johanna Niden, I'm the Community Development Director of the City of Evanston. Uh, we do call this meeting to order. Is there a motion to suspend the rules? Make a motion to suspend the rules to allow member participation electronically or by telephone. Second. All right, Katie, please call the roll. Niden. Aye. Jones. Aye. Griffith. Aye. Schnur. Aye. Uh, did member Kano um, get on the meeting? Still showing him as joining, so just call him Callahan. Okay, uh, Callahan. Aye. Biggs. Aye. Tristan. Aye. Eckersberg? Aye. Pink. Aye. Motion carries 9-0. Great, thank you. Uh, next item is the meeting minutes of September 22nd. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes. Second. Second. Katie, please call the roll. Knighton? Aye. Jones? Aye. Griffith? Aye. Schnur. Aye. Callahan. Jane. Uh, Biggs. Aye. Tristan. Aye. Eckersberg. Aye. Hank. Aye. Motion carries. Um, may I ask who seconded? I heard Mario. Who's Mario? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we have, we'll, we'll go through the business, new and old business in a moment. Um, if you would like to provide public comment to any of these items, please send me a message via the chat uh, or when the item, when I acknowledge public comment, please use the hand, raise your hand um, icon. Uh, but the chat is a little easier for me to manage um, in terms of make sure that we get through things. Uh, so first item of business is uh, old business 584 Lincoln Street, the sign variation. Um, they've asked to hold this, so um, I don't think we need any. We're not going to do any motion to hold or anything like that. We'll just um, we'll just bring it back up when they're they're ready to bring it back. Uh, next item is new business, um, thirty four thirty four Central Street. This is a concept review. Charles Marla seeks a concept review for a proposed plan development. The proposed plan development is to demolish the existing Unity Church on the North Shore. And they construct a new two-story, 20,000 square foot building for a daycare child, center child, Kensington School in the R2 single family residential district. Three site plan alternatives have been provided. Um, so again, what we'll do is uh, if you have any comments, please, uh, or if you'd like to provide public comment, just send me a message in the chat. We'll go through uh, staff comments um, after the applicant's presentation. This is for concept only. There's no, there's no application um, before us right now. So uh, I will turn it over. Chuck, I don't know if you're going to do it or if, if one of the other team members is going to walk through this, but uh, why I can do you it. walk through the three concepts? Yeah, I can do it. Hi, everybody. Um, nice to be here again. Um, we are giving this another try after our um, unsuccessful attempt at, uh, on Heard Street, um, but we're very excited about this location. It's um, looking like it's, uh, it's giving us a lot more room to work with, a little bit, a much busier intersection, um, and it just seems a more suitable site for Kensington School. Um, we've spoken to staff a little bit about our site plan. They've asked that we give uh, three different variations of our site plan, um, and, um, and we've done so. Uh, the most important thing here is that, you know, I, I think that with this application, we are um, really looking only for some minor relief, and that is with this fence and perhaps um, some required playground equipment. Um, other than that, I believe that we, um, we're satisfactorily parked. We have met our height requirements, our setbacks, our open space, our you know impervious space, our, our impervious percentages, um, all of that kind of thing. Um, we have one real issue here, not a real issue, but uh, one thing to really be uh, cognizant of, and that is that uh, the apartment complex to the south uh, currently shares an easement, um, a cross access easement with the church for access to their little parking strip. Um, to the south of this property. Currently, it runs down the middle of 
of Unity Church's property. Um, and in all three of our site plan schematics, um, we've asked and they've agreed, I believe, to um, have us move this furthest to the west. Um, the main reason being with this is that, you know, as this is a child care center, we've got obviously a lot, a lot of young children, ages infant through five or six um, in this parking lot. Um, we're not as concerned about the infants and the toddlers, but at times the two-year-old through the five or six-year-old population, they are walking through that parking lot um, accompanied by a mother or father or guardian. And um, we really do like to maintain some control over the traffic in our parking lot. Um, it's not to say that, you know, we can control every parent as they drive through it, we can't, but we really wanted to not uh, have the, you know, the, the neighbors to the south have actual access to where the, um, where our patrons park and where those children will be getting in and out of their, into their parents or guardians cars. So there, that was why we moved this um, ingress egress driveway furthest to the left, we feel it's the best way to um, you know, get the folks that live to, you know, the neighbors to their, to their parking spaces for their, for their homes, um, as well as give us a little bit more exclusivity inside our parking lot to ensure a little bit more um, safety of those children and families as they move in and out of our parking spice, spaces. Um, you know, aside from that, the three schematics that we looked at, um, you know, are all, you know, scheme, scheme one and two are fairly similar and that they, um, they work very closely with the parking lot. Um, scheme two um, really fronts the building on Central Street. It's actually my favorite. Um, it looks uh, like it belongs on that block a little more than, um, you know, if the building were facing the parking lot, which is scheme one. Um, scheme three, which is um, the building facing uh, Gross Point, um, while it may, look the best as you're traveling up and down Gross Point, um, it doesn't work nearly, it doesn't work at all for our families. Um, you know, getting into the building, um, which is in the front of, which would be facing Gross Point at the front doors um, would be really difficult, especially in snowy rainy days. Um, you know, mothers, fathers, guardians, you know, bringing those children in with strollers and or car carriers uh, would be really, really difficult. Um, it's, it's really optimal for us to have one point of ingress and egress into our building for safety and security. Um, and to, you know, not have that, you know, facing gross point and, and scheme three really wouldn't work. Um, so these are the three plans that we have. Um, you know, I love one and two, um, but from a from a zoning perspective, um, I feel aside from the special use that we need um, inside this R2, uh, the only relief I believe we could be looking for would be to have some relief as it relates to um, the, the fence and the playground being technically in the front yard out at Gross Point. Um, this is a really difficult site to ascertain front yard, rear yard, side yard, et cetera, et cetera. It's a super unusual shape. Um, and you know, if this were more of a right angle, you know, out on Gross Point and Central, I think we'd have a much better time with it. Um, but we are trying to do as best we can to become a part of Evanston. And we're happy this site became available so shortly after our, um, our failed attempt on Heard Street. Um, but aside from that, I welcome any commentary from staff. Um, I've got my architect with me, Lance Lauderdale. He's, uh, he's available to answer any questions as well. Um, I know there'll be some traffic issues that we want to study, et cetera, et cetera. I'd be happy to bring the rest of our consultants, engineers, and such in, um, you know, once we get a little bit further down the road, if we do. So that's pretty much all I have for now. Great. Uh, staff comments or questions? Why are you so attached to the, the single uh, configuration of your building? Um, it's not an attachment as much it is as it is. Um, these are all very small sites, Stevenston, unfortunately. Um, you know, the site that we had on Heard Street, this building seemed to fit well on it. When, when this site became available, we really, we kind of worked backwards um, from a, you know, what does this site need? Parking and ingress and egress that, um, 
that access and easement to our, our neighbors to the south. Um, this building doesn't need to be a rectangle. It can be a square. Um, it can be a little bit longer. It can be a little bit shorter. Um, but it definitely needs to be two stories. We know that much for certain right now. Um, from an interior layout perspective, it'd be difficult to make it a trapezoid to fit that, that strange hard corner. Um, so we're doing our best to try and make it work inside the confines of these setbacks and the you know, obscure nature of the shape of this property. Seems that like reconfiguring it might, you know, adapting it to the strange configuration of the lot might be helpful in some of these cases. Yeah. Well, we have an issue where parking can only be in the rear yard. Um, so, with Gross Point being the front, the rear then becomes kind of where it is. Um, you know, I, I don't. If we tried putting, you know, the school where the parking is, we're not able to put the parking where the school currently is. Um, if you could, uh, Johanna, if you could go to, can you go to um, the layout number two, perhaps? Um, seeing, or, or one, seeing that those are perhaps the, the two we'd prefer to, to, um, to apply for here. Um, this is the one that, that, that perhaps works the best. You know, truly the best for our families would be number one, where they could, where the building could be right in front of the parking and they could park and walk right in. That'd be more traditional, similar to other locations of ours where the parking lot really is right in front of the schools. Um, but, you know, we kind of have to work with the size and the shape of this, um, this strange lot. And what is the distance in scheme A and scheme B of the play equipment to the curb line? So uh, the setback on on um, on Gross Point is 27 feet. Um, I can't really tell. Lance, do you know where in, in scheme A and scheme B we kind of encroach on that 27 it's, or that 15, that, that uh, 27 foot setback? It's going to be several feet, most likely, at least the bottom, uh, the southern playground equipment. Um, up top, yeah, it might encroach on, it might not, um, but probably would. Now, mind you, um, with, with the playground equipment and child care centers, keep, please keep in mind that we're required to have a six foot fall zone perimeter around the entire play structure. So imagine if you would, that this south um, in this scheme, let's say the, the southernmost play area is a big jungle gym, let's say, right? Um, surrounding that is has to be six feet of, of fall surface, which is tan bark or compost mm -hmm. material. Um, so the play structure itself wouldn't be right up against the edge of that 27 foot easement or that fence where it would where it would land right now if, if shown if you know if constructed where it would be shown. Um, instead, we'd be six feet off of that rectangle. And you know, as we continue to move this ball further down the field, I'd be able to show, you know, different configurations for those those various play structures and with those fall radii, um, you know, where they'd land. But this is just for you know illustrative purposes only. Um, you know, the biggest benefit for us would to be able to construct would be for us to be able to construct that fence, which would be probably a you know a four foot white scalloped picket fence um, in that, you know, on that property line. And for anybody that's so inclined, we have that we have a, an example of that fence at our Glenview location. I'm sure if you did a, a Google Street View drive by, you could see what we're talking about if um, if you didn't want to drive over there. From my perspective, I think that I'm not particularly married to any particular building orientation. I'll leave that to the planners in what should face the different streets. But I do think it's really critical to have the um, controlled access for dropping your child off and picking your child up 
from the door closest to the parking lot only. And I'd like to see, similar to scheme, the third scheme, see where the playground is in between the building and the parking lot, just because I think a lot of times, particularly we're seeing this in COVID, but also pre-COVID, as much as possible, uh, daycares often do the drop off and pick up from the playground. What I really don't like is the idea that there's a main entrance where people can bring their children directly off of either Central or Rose Point Road to drop off their kids because I think that will lead to um, more traffic issues along Central or Gross Point Road as people run in and out and try to do things quickly. I think it's probably better to have all of that um, occurring within the parking lot and within the property essentially. So and I'm, I'm not really voting a specific scheme, but I think that there's a lot of positive benefits to the layout in scheme C. Yeah, I kind of, I, I would agree with you with, with, with regard to the, um, to the acts to the driveway, um, having the playgrounds in the front of the building really operationally is, is very, very difficult. We've never done it before. So in, so in 50 odd years, we've never put a playground in front of the building. Um, operationally, it's just not, you know, I don't think it would work really. But um, yeah, I, I, I'd say scheme one or scheme two, as I mentioned before, you know, the one thing, as you may recall from our previous application on Heard Street, um, pair, we do require the parents park and walk their children in. This isn't a typical preschool where parents stay in their cars and and the children are ferried in and out um, into the into the cars like a, a, a more traditional morning or PM preschool program. Um, from a child care center perspective, um, you know, parents are are required to park and, and accompany their child into the school. I, you know, I think that's an interesting point, but I still think that that interaction should be the building needs to be situated such that the main, the, the controlled entrance for parents to walk their kids in and pick their kids up really needs to be the entrance closest to the parking lot. Not, it should not be an entrance that is facing one of the streets. I, I agree with Laura on that. And also another concern would be during the winter, um, during snow removal, um, you know, a lot of our trucks would be making uh, several passes down that street. We can't have any buildup of vehicles. And we also uh, more than likely will be storing some snow along that curb line. They're possibly putting some hazardous conditions for anybody exiting and entering their vehicles. On Central Street, you mean? On Central or, or Gross Point. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, I mean, this was our scheme one was our original scheme. Um, we were asked to provide a scheme showing fronting central, which I actually do. I like from a perspective of, you know, the building looking as if it were, you know, it belongs there or, you know, it was part of was part of that road um, for a long time. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm not I'm not liking the, the gross point frontage at all, really. From an operational perspective, I, I don't think it works. Other comments or questions? Just like note that there is a water main that goes underneath the parking lot area to that uh, residential uh, <laughs> development to the south as well. So you'll have to watch out for that. Yeah. Do we know where that is by any chance? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, more on the eastern easterly side of the parking lot. But I'll I'll be able to give you a better. So where the current drive acts, where the current drive line aisle is probably right now, to the to Unity. That would make sense. I'm showing it a little bit to the west of the drive aisle. Okay. Great. Thanks. And then just to like kind of revisit the play equipment yeah. piece again. Um, I'm a little wary about play equipment located along Gross Point Road. And the reason is, although I, I understand you have, um, you have like the clear buffer zone, you're gonna fence the area. Uh, 
during snow operations, especially, there just seem, uh, Gross Point Road is a fast moving street and the plow operation on it is frequent. We're throwing a lot of salt on Green Bay Road or on Gross Point Road, sorry, Edgar, I know you guys really try to conserve salt, but it's, um, it's unrealistic to think that in the middle of snow operations that the intrusion of salt and snow and debris isn't going to get into your property as quickly as we go up and down Green Bay Road. Mm -hmm. So I think there may be some maintenance impacts for your operations for sure. play equipment, even with the setback. And I know there's a setback. It's, a, it's actually a pretty generous setback, but yeah. I think we've all seen that on the arterial roads, um, the snow operation can get pretty intense and have impacts on a private property. Yeah, well, with the setback's 27 feet either way, and that's all gonna be grass and plantings and landscape. Um, you know, obviously there won't be any children playing on those play structures in the middle of the winter, especially when there's, you know, <laughs> probably snow plows going up and down, down the road. Um, they typically just go out there and stomp around in the snow. Um, but yeah, we'll keep, we will definitely keep that in mind. Um, you know, I, but yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. The, the, those snow plows probably do have quite a bit of an offset spray when they're, when they're booking up and down that street. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll be sure to keep that in mind. Thank you. All right. Anything else about layout before we move to, um, anything with suggestions with landscaping or or other site issues. Is, is there a reason why two play areas are needed? Can, can they be combined in, into one play it, you know, area? It's all, it's all one big play area. Um, we, do tend, we do tend to have an infant yard, like an infant toddler yard, and then a twos and older yard. We don't, um, you know, five-year-olds and infants don't play well together too, too often, especially when they're on the same kind of play structure. They're, the environments for the kids are both um, age specific. So um, one of those two locations would typically be uh, an infant yard, um, an infant through toddler yard, and the other one would be a twos and up location. Um, in some of our spots, like in our Glenview school, for example, we've, we've got you know two and a half acres out there. We've actually set up a separate yard within a yard with a fence um, to create a separate, you know, entirely separate environment for those younger kids. Um, so, you know, to directly answer your question, one of those two play structures, call it the, the circle or the rectangle, um, would be the smaller climber for little kids. The other would be a larger climber for bigger kids. Um, I did happen to go look at the street view of the Glenview location. Um, I don't know if this fence is quite the aesthetic we would expect in Evanston. It's a little, um, I just maybe th let's think, think a little bit about, different about fencing. We don't normally have, it's kind of a, a bright, um, we generally don't, we want more um, transparency in our, I realize that's not ideal for kids, but there's, we, we have parks where we have used different kind of fencing that um, you know keeps kids in spaces and keeps people in spaces. This might just be a little bit too, Sure. Um, not you have some cool, guidelines. Right? I'd be happy to look at them. Obviously, fence is a fence. As long as it keeps the kids out and the other stuff in, then we're we're keeps kids in and other stuff out. We're all set. Um, and then I don't. I know this is just concept, but um, just kind of might bring this up. It'd be great to have some kind of bike parking or bike area. Of course. Um, I I think it, almost every daycare, child care space in Evanston, you see people. Um, riding their bikes and bringing kids to the schools with bikes. Um, yeah. It's a pretty popular thing right now. Yeah. The electric bikes and the little the seats. Yep, we had that. Our, we had a we had bike a bike parking provision on Heard Street. Uh, that was an oversight on this early schematic. I'm sure you know we, there's more than enough room here um, to do a pretty a pretty substantial bicycle parking area here. Fortunately, so we can do that. And then I, I just echo everybody else's comments about moving the, um, the play equipment off this off gross that corner, maybe closer to the building. If if this third scheme isn't the op best option, um, and I think that that sort of covers my comments. Um, anything in terms? Of, I mean, I, oh, the last comment I had was, uh, you know, that's a 
it's a nice corner. There's a lot of there's a lot of sort of natural green landscaping lawn. I think the way any any ability to keep that um, that corner kind of soft and and green and lush and particularly landscape it so there's that sense yeah um, of pre of you know kind of sense of place that's created there now. Yeah, no, that's that's the goal. Um, I think with you know with either scheme scheme one or scheme two, um, look, we could pull these place structures in a little bit. I think the real um, the real benefit for us would be to have the, you know, to, to have that, um, to have that fence on that, on that property line. Um, and just, you know, if, if there's, you know, a way to do that and have some relief there, that's probably the only relief we're looking for here on this project. Um, and I could scoot those play structures in a bit um, where you see those two, the circle and the square or the rectangle, I could scoot those closer to the building without, without a problem actually. You know, get those out of the setback as long as the you know the built the, the property or the fence were on it. Are there any other comments? Anything? Any public further public works comments? Yeah, I do have questions about the landscaping and what the intentions are as far as the trees that are there currently, um, and what you know what the impact of the construction is going to be to to those trees, and then what kind of um, you know what's going to be done post construction. So, you know, I don't have a tree study done on the site, um, but, you know, obviously any trees that are currently in the way of, you know, this parking lot or, or the building, obviously we need to be removed if on the property, obviously nothing will be taken down in the right of way. Um, and then, you know, like, like many of our schools, you know, our, our goal is to, is to replant um, substantially. So um, we really don't have any plans per se right now. I think that would go a little bit further down the road. We engaged in a landscape architect for our last application um, on Heard Street. Um, I have a feeling that um, that staff and the plan department was was happy with the plan that was submitted. I know there's, um, you know, there's a monarch butterfly pledge and there's, um, you know, bird friendly Evanston. There's a lot of different uh, things we learned about uh, during that last application that I know we'll be cognizant of on this one. Um, but, uh, you know, to answer your question directly, I don't have any, I don't have a landscape plan right now, but I know we will be heavily landscaping this. And to Johanna's point, um, keeping that hard corner soft is, is also of interest to us as well. Uh, that's really, that's a beautiful corner. There's a lot of light there. Um, and it's great to be able to, you know, kind of look across the corner, um, as people are maybe perhaps trying to make a right-hand turn from uh, Central on to Gross Point, we want to be able to keep that corner kind of clear for them um, just so they can kind of look across and see what's going on. I guess one of the concerns that I have is that in that neighborhood, there are not many very, there are not very many places that, you know, these kids can walk to, um, to enjoy nature. There's no, I mean, there's obviously Lovelace is not that far away, but it's on, it's down a very busy street. And so it might not be reasonable for those kids to be able to walk to a place that has trees, right? That has plants and greenery, um, which is critical to childhood development um, to have access to those things. And so, you know, it's a bit concerning that there are some large mature trees on this property um, that would, you know, be removed just because of the construction um, and then replanted. But we also know that those trees are gonna take a while to grow back. Um, and those kids in the meantime, are not gonna have access to, to that greenery, which is critical. So you're speaking to the, the children in our care at the school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, look, if the site were bigger, we'd be able to do more with it. Um, you know, this is currently zoned R2. I think that if Kensington School weren't looking to come here, I think a, a, a larger multifamily development would as well, would otherwise. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, the church is is selling the property. They, And, you know, I don't think there's a, a viable... Um, interested buyer in keeping the church intact. I think so a redevelopment here is um, is pretty much what what is going to happen, you know, what's going to happen. The, the parking lot, we're, we're, we're pretty much keeping the same, you know, the, the parking lots in the same context. So I don't know what trees are, are around there. Um, you know, any trees that are in the current yard, as we show in scheme A or B, um, we'll be keeping all those mature trees as we can. Um, you know, obviously any tree that lands inside the footprint of the school, um, you know, unfortunately will have to, you know, be taken down. But I think by the same token, um, you know, we'd probably be seeing some kind of 
residential construction development going on there as well that would yield the same result, which is any which is a mature tree being taken down. Um, so there's a large Norway maple on the south side by the play area that you've outlined here. That would be nice to to preserve that tree. Okay. Um, it's 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 a nice nice specimen. It's in good health. No issues with it, and it's at an area that it could easily be preserved. Another item is that if you when you take into consideration the landscaping, if you could think of some sort of a greenery that will actually help with some noise control as well. So sure. some side issues for the south side there with the apartment complex. I mean, they would definitely benefit and appreciate some sort of probably visual screen as well as a as some sort of sound barrier in that area. Sure. So, um, um, that would be know, appreciated. I know, yeah, I, I know there, are, you know, Evanston's done a really great job of planting that parkway. There are really beautiful trees running up and down Gross Point. Um, and, you know, obviously we'll be preserving all those. Those are, you know, not in our purview to take down. Um, is that, yeah, that maple that's sitting, well, that's part of, that's part of the parkway. I'm looking at a street view. Um, yeah, that one big tree that's kind of tucked in right near the school or right near the church right now. Um, yeah, we'll do our best to save that. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Going back to the bike parking real quick, I would recommend that um, any bike parking placed on site should be placed on Central Street rather than Gross Point Road if you're leaning towards option yes. one or two, then um, because of the direction of the building at that location, it would also make sense for the bike parking to be uh, near the entrance as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think in, in scheme one or scheme two, um, you know, there's a cutout in that northeast corner of the parking lot um, where the, you know, just by the nature of the, the right angle of the parking lot there, um, I, see, I see that as being a really good spot for, um, for a bike rack and a, and a fairly large one. If those spots are 20 or 18 inches, or 18 feet deep, um, it, it could be a pretty, a pretty good size bike, bike rack, especially if, if the, um, you know, if many folks are, are using their bike and a lot of employees for that matter are biking to work as well, um, that would work out great. And, and then just a reminder from last time, um, any concrete pad for bike parking, it would be great if you could make sure that it's extended to allow for uh, cargo carriers on bikes. Uh, I'm one of those families in Evanston that bikes their toddler to daycare. Yeah. And so, um, usually we have a trailer and so making sure that there is room for a trailer is very important when you're talking about bike parking at a daycare facility. You got it. It's a great idea. I didn't know that, but we'll make a note. And then are you planning to extend the sidewalk? Is that, am I reading this right? Uh, can you show me which one you're looking at? On Central, on Central Street, is that a plan? Um, let me see. By our own code now, uh, sidewalks would be required to extend the entire length of the property where it fronts streets. I think so if the sidewalk doesn't exist, it has to be extended. Yeah. yeah, so if there's a sidewalk on Central right now, um, that would obviously stay. I think on scheme one, where we showed the daycare uh, facing the parking lot, facing west, basically, uh, we're showing three connections to that sidewalk from our site. And, and obviously, these are all this is all schematic. Um, we're going to talk to staff as we move, or I guess we're talking to you now. So, um, you know, let's go back to let's go back to scheme one, for example. Um, Lance drew this showing, you know, three connections to the public walk from, from the school. One, one the patio off the back, uh, two in the middle off of what are more than likely fire exits, and one is the walk off the front. Um, would you want to see those there? I mean, I, I, we're at your discretion as far as, you know, 
Lance, are those, are those for, you know, in case of snow and for, for egress out to the public way kind of thing? Yeah, I think Joanna was talking about the, the sidewalk that's in the public way. Currently it stops where the access is to the apartments, but we got rid of it. And then I showed the sidewalk, sidewalk extending past oh. our parking lot to the north of our parking lot. My bad, okay. But it sounds like we need to do that anyway. Um, sure. We're gonna have to do that. You're gonna need to do that. And then it looks like there's some, there's some, I, I don't know where you're gonna do this, but there's this, I think it's a maple tree kind of in the path of that potential sidewalk or near it. So, um, but that might, that tree also might be what, something you're, you're thinking you need to remove because of the driveway. Um, so we may need to revisit that because that, that's a nice looking tree, right? I mean, I, I, is that a maple tree, everybody? Yeah, you're, you're, uh, that, you're, you're right. That, that, that area, there's vegetation in there that any type of sidewalk is going to be extremely detrimental. Um, there is an opportunity, though, in the park, in the parking lot to put some items, put some trees in there. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, that extending that sidewalk is going to be going to be a challenge. Yeah, we're not we're not opposed to replanting new trees. Um, we do it everywhere all the time. Um, happy to I, talk to you all about it whenever whenever we get to that point. Sure. Just just keep in mind that I'd rather preserve as many trees than replace. Of course. So I, I can't get 20 years on a tree except no. after 20 years. So. I, I know. We wish, I'm right there with you. My, I always drive my landscapers crazy. They, they want to bring out these little itty bitty dopey trees and, and we always try and, and find the biggest ones we can. You know, from, just from a perspective of, you know, owning the property and running the business, you, you, want, you want it to look good. You want it to look, um, you know, you, we build these buildings so that they, they look as if they've been part of the community for a long time. And a lot of that is landscaping. So um, we, do, we do really enjoy a lot of landscaping in our schools. So maybe as you move forward, it makes sense to meet with Michael Callahan or Emily on site to go over what trees are there and what might be good um, opportunities to save and, and move things around. Um, yeah, I'd love that opportunity. And then, then we're not doing this at the next step or when you're in for, for approvals, we can just have resolved this um, right. up front. Uh, okay, um, any other staff comments? Because we do have a member of the public that would like to provide a comment. No. Okay, Mr. Bumberger. Good afternoon. So I live directly across the street from Unity on the north side of Central. So I have significant vested interest in what happens across the street. Uh, and with that in mind, when I heard about the Unity plan to, to sell the property, uh, I talked with um, the church leadership and made it very clear that the, the neighbors would like to work with Unity, work with the developer, and come up with a plan that's mutually beneficial. Uh, we've had other proposals around Hot Dog Island over the years that have not met with great neighborhood support, and they've gone down the tube. So uh, this time we have a proposal that um, conceptually is very attractive. There's a lot of, of really good things about uh, Kensington School that I think are attractive to the neighborhood. Um, one of the uh, preferences that, that I expressed and other neighbors expressed uh, to church leadership is we'd like to sit down at the table and discuss our concerns and come up with a overall plan that uh, is taken to the city and receives approval without any, any terrific hassle on anyone's part. So that is something we need to do soon because I did not see the design review uh, notification until yesterday, I've been out of town, uh, I tried to call Chuck today, have not yet connected, uh, but we need to sit down and bring the neighbors together, in, in particular, those neighbors who are adjacent to the property uh, to hash out some of our concerns. And looking at um, the proposal and listening to the discussion today, um, I, I noticed the definition of what is to be the front yard and the rear yard, very traditional form. And because the site is challenging, I think it would be refreshing to 
kind of look at it open-ended without concern about what's the front and the rear and the side and so forth, but just say, what, what is a good plan for that property? And the traffic flow is a major, major item. And that's the, can be the, the showstopper that we have to deal with. And I'm concerned about the, uh, the way the parking lot is, is designed and the, uh, the two-way flow on the, on the west side of it to provide access to the apartments. Uh, it just looks awkward to me in terms of people coming in, backing up. Uh, and I, I like to see some, some thought given to providing the apartment access on the south end of the Unity property, you know, put in a cut off Gross Point that gets people into the apartment area, people flowing into the parking area for the uh, Kensington School and, and create more of a, of a flow through the area rather than everybody clogging into a tr very traditional parking lot setup, particularly when you've got people all arriving at the same time, leaving at the same time. Um, it's been a long time since I've had any little kids around school, but occasionally I drive by these places and it, it looks like you know, mass confusion. Uh, obviously, from a neighborhood perspective, uh, not having anything happening on uh, weekends, uh, evenings is, is extremely uh, attractive. And in terms of uh, landscaping, uh, something to note is that um, the parking lot needs to have full evergreen you know, screening. Uh, currently, the screening is, is negligible. Uh, when we get into the winter sun, we get lots of glare off cars that are parked there. So definitely, uh, you know, significant screening. And, and, and Chuck has talked about the emphasis on landscaping. I've been by the Kensington School in Glenview quite often and been very pleased with, uh, with what they've done there. And then from the uh, review of the plans that we're, we're looking at today, it would be helpful if we had a a simple overlay of the current unity footprint so we could kind of compare the current building with the you know, proposed building, kind of understand kind of where things are going to fall. Um, so those are a few quick comments. Um, overall, uh, excited about the opportunity and look forward to working with uh, Kensington and the city and uh, bringing it on. Um, I don't have anybody else signed up. I think uh, Chuck and team, you guys have gotten a lot of good feedback here today from everybody, and um, we look forward to the formal application. All right. Thanks, Johanna. Great to see you again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Take care. Next up is 1900 Sherman Avenue, major adjustment to a plan development. The Housing Authority of Cook County submits for a major adjustment to a plan development at 1900 Sherman Avenue, previously approved by Ordinance 109020 to construct a 16-story residential building in the C1A mixed-use mixed zoning district. The applicant proposes changes to the following site development allowances. One, a decrease in the number of dwelling units from 168 to 152. Two, a decrease in the number of below-grade parking spaces from 37 to 25, and three, a decrease in zoning height from 172 feet, eight inches to 168 feet, four inches. Uh, great. Um, who is on? Bill, are you on for half? Yes, I am. And um, I will share my screen to um, uh, show you a PowerPoint presentation. Um, right. And if anybody would like to, we'll do staff comments and public comments. Um, if anybody uh, would like to uh, get provide any comment, um, send me a note in the, the chat or uh, raise your hand, please. Great, great, thank you. So um, as, as you said, Johanna, um, uh, we are coming back to the city with some uh, modifications of the original design. Um, a lot of this is really um, standard kind of design development changes as we go from conceptual design, which is what we had for the uh, uh, original project approval into design development. Some things do change. In addition, um, we have done some um, subservice investigation of the site and have found that we need to um, have a separation between the existing permanent building and the new building, which has caused some um, relatively minor changes in the program. But since Evanston zoning ordinance is very strict on, on 
changes, uh, narrowly defining minor changes, and then anything that's not a minor change, it's a major change. We have four major changes that we need to uh, get specific approval for at uh, 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 go through DAPR, uh, go through the plan commission, then have it voted on by city council. Um, so uh, our agenda is as follows. So I'll, I'll provide some introductory comments and then we're gonna address each of the major changes, one, two, three, and four individually. Um, Greg uh, Klausowski from uh, Papa George Hames Architects will, will assist me. So in each of these major adjustments, we will talk about the need for revision, which Greg will cover. And then I will talk about uh, the justification for the approval. So just want to make sure Greg is on the line. Greg, are you with us? Yeah, Bill, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry, I don't have my video working, but I am on the line. Okay, that's great. Uh, so uh, let's go on to uh, these introductory comments. So essentially, um, uh, the project is, will not be compromised in any way. The high quality of design and the approved project will be maintained. The refinements to the, uh, to the building will not be noticeable from the outside. Um, yes, if you really compared the two uh, very, very closely, yes, you'd see some changes, but they're not substantive. They're not qualitative. Uh, they're just really design development uh, changes. Um, we are proposing uh, a reduction in the total number of units from 168 to 152, um, but we will maintain uh, the number of affordable uh, units uh, promised. Uh, and so by reducing the total number and maintaining the number of affordable units, we'll actually be increasing the proportion of affordable units. And as you can see from the two um, 3D renderings, you see on the left-hand side, the uh, uh, exterior appearance of the building as approved and, and what we're proposing. And um, there are some very, very minor uh, changes, but qualitatively, there's nothing substantive uh, uh, being proposed. Uh, so the need for the amendments came about through two discoveries. One was a structural issue with the Perlman Building Foundation uh, underground, which um, necessitates separating uh, uh, creating a 10 or 12 foot separation between the two buildings. The approved plans had uh, the, the buildings touching and the underground parking would, would have abutted uh, the underground foundation of the Perlman building that we thought was there, but instead there's a, a, a slab foundation, which Greg will talk about later, but that was one discovery that, that necess necessitated a change in the program, uh, end up reducing the number of underground parking spaces we could get and um, also contributed to a change in the floor plans and a reduction um, in the number of buildings. The second discovery we made was that, um, you know, we were, uh, we went through the approval process right as uh, COVID-19 was, was, was hitting and um, there have been some changes in tenant preferences uh, as a result of COVID-19. And if anybody hasn't realized, you know, COVID-19 will make some permanent changes in, in how we live. Um, you know, we're still not back to normal and probably never will be completely the way we were before. And this has um, ramifications in terms of our unit design and how we um, think we can uh, appeal to the market in the best possible way, uh, having larger units and less common area, uh, which, is, uh, which is what we focus on in the approved plan. So we'll have fewer apartments, but larger apartments and less common area inside the building. Uh, so here are the um, four major adjustments kind of uh, um, uh, in an overview form. So reducing the number of units from 168 to 152. We're reducing the height of the building. You know, and with a lot of ordinances, if you're making something smaller in a plan development, you don't need uh, formal um, uh, uh, approval to do that. It's, it's a minor uh, adjustment, but in evidence in case, since it's not defined as a minor um, amendment is a major adjustment. So we need approval to reduce the height of the building. Uh, we are reducing the number of on-site parking spaces by 12. Uh, and um, a consequence of the redesigned floor plan is an increase in floor air ratio very, very modestly from 4.33 to 4.37. Even though we're reducing the total amount of floor area on the, on the site and in the new building, 
uh, we have a very modest increase in the floor area ratio. So that's what we're requesting approval for and a positive recommendation from this DAPR committee. So we'll start now with uh, talking about major adjustment number one, which is the reduction in dwelling units. And I'm gonna turn it over to Greg, who will talk about the uh, redesigned floor plan and, um, and the impact of that on the uh, development and the reduction in units. Greg? Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, we included on the right-hand side of the screen, um, both the original uh, proposed uh, building floor plan that shows 12 units per floor uh, that was approved uh, by the city and, and the proposal that we're having now, which is reduced to 11 units per floor. And really the primary difference that you can see here uh, that's important to note is what Bill was referring to earlier, that uh, the building used to come close and touch the building to the north. And now uh, in part because of our discovery about the foundation system, we're pulling that building. So the north face uh, on the bottom diagram is running effectively east to west, uh, clear all the way through and not bumping out to the north. Uh, what this is really doing is allowing us to both reconfigure the units um, so that they are uh, still slightly larger uh, than, than the average uh, because we are taking off just a small amount of square footage and then reconfiguring that into 12 units um, or into 11 units from 12. Um, that reconfiguration is resulting in a lower unit count, as Bill had already said. That's going to result in uh, lower rates of traffic and parking demand. Otherwise, there really shouldn't be any uh, results outside of that. And this refinement was due to COVID-19 and some market preferences to have <clears throat> a, a different unit mix and an adjustment to the size of the units uh, for each unit. Great. So um, in terms of justification for approving this major adjustment. Um, um, you know, each of the four major adjustments uh, were part of the original approval. They were, they were deemed to have met the applicable standards um, and were approved as part of the original application. We think rather than go through each of the, uh, the standards for special use, um, uh, which technically apply, uh, we'll leave that to, to your committee, but we think some common sense um, um, uh, assessment of this is, is needed. And um, we think focusing on uh, the reasonableness of the request, do any of these requests, of these major adjustments increase any impacts or do they reduce the project's public benefits? And as, re as relates to the reduction in um, the unit count, I, I think the request is reasonable. Um, there's there's a, a strong rationale for changing the floor plan in response to COVID. Uh, and also in response to separating uh, uh, the two buildings uh, in response to the um, design of the, the Pullman Foundation. So that's a reasonable request. Uh, they don't increase any impacts. In fact, they, they decrease impacts in terms of, of traffic and parking. Um, and they don't reduce any of the, public's, uh, uh, the project's public benefits because we're maintaining all of the benefits. We're maintaining the affordable housing. Uh, we're maintaining all of the uh, public uh, space uh, on the ground floor, on, on, the, uh, uh, on the exterior of the project. Uh, we're maintaining the high uh, design quality uh, of the project. So we're not uh, reducing any of these public benefits. And therefore we think this major adjustment merits um, this committee's approval. Um, Bill, can I just ask you to, um, I don't know if you were gonna go do this for every, every item, but. Uh -huh. Um, we're I, we're gonna I'm gonna lose staff and quorum and I I want to get you a decision today. Okay. Okay. Um, so I guess you're asking me to move the the the, the presentation quickly. Okay. So I mean make well, make sure make your points, but okay. I just want okay. you to be aware that we we may lose okay. quorum here, and I want to make sure you get to the next step. Okay. We we will we will expedite this. So uh, Greg, very briefly talk about the reduction in building height and, and what it's yeah. all about. This, this one's fairly easy. Really what happened here is we, uh, in between the original proposal and the time we've had some design development, we've just been able to tighten things up a little bit and reduce the height of the building a bit. Um, so there's a slight decrease in the overall height that we'd be looking for with this proposal. Right, okay. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, odd that we have to ask for approval to reduce the height. Height was one of the major um, points of discussion in the original approval. Um, and so I think that the 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 uh, logic behind uh, reducing height should be should be fairly evident. So let's just um, go on then 
to the next uh, uh, major adjustment, which is reduction in on-site parking, um, which probably has, has the most need for, for discussion. Greg, please go through the, um, uh, uh, what we found out with respect to the Perlman Building uh, Foundation and the need for separation. Yep, I'll try to make this quick, but uh, so if there are any questions, once I uh, do this, we can we can pick up on the questions. But effectively, you're seeing a diagram on the left that's showing what was assumed, which is fairly reasonable. Uh, the Perlman building is shown in a darker color on the left. On the left-hand drawing, our proposed building is on the right. We were proposing a below grade, a two-story below grade garage, and assumed that the building had a pier or caisson foundation that would push those uh, in the loads from the building down below grade, shown in uh, pink color on the left. On the right, so what we actually discovered, the building is supported on a large mat slab foundation. And effectively what that's doing is, is instead of pushing the structural loads down below the uh, level of the basement, it's starting just a few feet below grade. So that uh, anything you're trying to build within that zone of influence, which is again, the pink on the right image, becomes difficult to near impossible to do because of the weight of the building applying those loads on the walls. So this is part of the reason we had to make an adjustment to the garage uh, and pull the building away to get out of that zone and, and make this uh, a constructible garage. Okay, and so um, given that we um, um, were providing only a, a small portion of what the ordinance said we needed in terms of parking on site, I think this is um, something that needs to be discussed. Um, we um, we have always we always were planning on relying on leasing um, offsite paced spaces in nearby buildings. So as part of the original approval, we provided a letter from the E2 building that said that they would commit to leasing us um, 50 spaces. We're also in conversations with the link building next door, and and we'll uh, get an agreement with them for additional spaces. The Parking study we had at the um, at the time of the project approval um, projected a need a maximum uh, demand of 51 spaces uh, at any given point in time for the building. In our public meeting that we had just uh, a month ago, we um, uh, this was discussed and we we um, saw that the parking study was flawed and that it uh, assumed um, all of the new occupants in the Emerson building would be affordable tenants, which was never intended, that was not the case. And so we just actually today, about 10 minutes before the meeting, I got a revised study which indicates a demand for 91 spaces, um, peak demand. We have, uh, we will have 39 on-site spaces. So uh, we already have a commitment from E2 of 50 spaces. We will provide, um, uh, spaces for every tenant who wants us or needs our help in providing a space. Uh, the housing authority is already committed to providing every resident in the Perlman building with a parking space free of charge, either on site or in a nearby building. Um, so every tenant who has a car in the Perlman building who needs a parking space will, will be provided a parking space free of charge by the housing authority. And we, we meaning um, uh, the housing authority will um, work with uh, uh, the nearby buildings who have surplus parking to provide all of our tenants in the new Emerson building uh, with a space if they if they need help in finding a space. So um, that has always been the the basis for uh, the provision of parking in this um, uh, project. It was it was deemed to be sufficient when we had the original um, uh, approval. Uh, we're reducing our on-site parking by 12 spaces, but we're reducing the number of units in the building by 16 uh, units. So we're actually um, decreasing the parking demand on site. Uh, we think that this is a, a reasonable request and um, consistent with the original approval. Great, uh, thank you. So I wanna check in and see if there are any staff comments or questions before we go to public comment. There was one more, which is the which is the increase in FAR. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. So so, um, Greg, just briefly talk about how we why FAR has increased. Uh, this really simply put, because of the fact that we reduced some square footage uh, per floor. These are the same two floor plans we were looking at before. The percentage of rentable space to the uh, circulation and core functions has just uh, changed slightly. That's resulting in the change uh, in the FAR. Uh, slightly because there's a little bit less 
rentable space uh, in proportion to the uh, central space on each floor plan. Yeah, so again, the total floor area has been decreased. Uh, the common area has decreased proportionally more than the occupied space has. Therefore, in terms of how the city calculates FAR, there's been a modest increase um, and there's no additional impact um, uh, being produced from this, this revision. Okay, so that is um, our presentation. We're, we're happy to answer questions uh, from the committee or, or others in attendance. All right, staff, any questions? We've seen, we saw this for two meetings in August, 2020. So I don't know if there's anything that we have to comment on. Uh, Johan, I've got a, a point of clarification um, for the adjustment. Typically, the FAR would be a major adjustment, um, that particular change, but since this particular development is providing all of the inclusionary housing ordinance uh, apartments on site, they get a bonus, I think it's this 1.0 on it bonus. So their increase actually doesn't actually affect what they were originally approved for. It wasn't originally a, a site development allowance anyway due to that bonus. So that's just noting that there is an increase in FAR, but it's not an actual uh, adjustment that is needed for this project. Thank you for that, Megan. So you only have three. <laughs> All right, any other comments or clarifications or questions from the staff? All right, um, I have Marsha um, for a question or comment. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Marsha and I'm a resident of the Pearlman building and I have uh, four different questions. So I don't know if you want them one at a time and then answer that, then I can go to question two, three, or four. Does that work for you? Go, go right ahead. Why don't you start? And we'll, we'll... Okay, so we talked about the parking uh, on site will be 39. What happens to the rest of the parking? And if people in that building also have caretakers and they're off site, will the caretakers parking have to be off-site also, uh, or will we, they get parking on the property? Right, right. So um, we uh, will have to work uh, on that fine point in terms of care caregivers and where they'll park. Uh, you know, our first commitment is to provide parking space for every Perlman resident who has a car and needs parking space and needs parking space. Um, and all I can tell you is that um, we will. Um, uh, we will work on that issue of um, caregivers parking and and look at what other buildings are doing you know, with with that issue and 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 where their caregivers park for other residential buildings in Evanston and and, and make a reasonable accommodation for that. Okay, one other part then to the parking. Uh, caretakers are here and some of the um, residents who have caretakers, you said that uh, you would provide transportation to it from the different parking. Would that transportation also be uh, available for the caretaker? Well, I, I don't recall saying that the Housing Authority would provide transportation between the permanent building and the location of, of the residents parking. We're gonna to try to accommodate as much of um, the Perlman parking on site. So we'll have 16 surface spaces off the alley um, and our latest um, survey of parking utilization on the site was for 18 spaces. Um, and so there may not be uh, very many people at all who have to park uh, 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 offsite. We can certainly accommodate a couple people in the, in the parking garage if that's necessary. So there may not be a need for transportation to say the E2 building or something like that. And we think if we can get um, uh, spaces in the link building, which we're confident of, that's right across the alley, you know, there would be no need for transportation there either. So we really don't think that transportation will be an issue to, to the parking spaces for the Perlman residents. But if it does, you will make uh, arrangements and you'll let us know prior to the construction, the start of the construction? Uh, if, uh, if there is a need for it, we will we will uh, accommodate that need. 
Okay, it's a good question. item for our construction management plan as they develop it. One of the things they have to do when they submit their building permit is to provide us a, a plan for how they're going to manage their construction activity and impact adjacent properties, which we, we've heard from other residents that the, the, at the Parliament building that this is a concern for the parking um, access. So we definitely are aware that that needs to be included. Um, can I ask you to ask your last question? Because I, I want I'm going to lose I'm going to lose quorum. I'm going to lose staff. OK, OK. Well, I have, I have three more questions. So <laughs> here's the other one. So the can original... we do can we do one more question? Because I, I have a, I have one other person that wants to provide comment and I, I have another applicant too, and I, I'm sure Mr. James um, can help, or if you wanna put them in writing, that would be, we can definitely get your answers as well. Uh, okay, th th these are just really fast. So will the public housing apartments also become larger? Uh, yes. Um, okay. So the, the, the units in the, the Emerson uh, will be larger than those in the Perlman. Okay, but I'm saying the public housing apartments will also be as large as the maximum pay people. So all of the public housing, one bedroom apartments, um, there will there will not be two bedroom public housing units. So so that's one thing to 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 just be clear on. And um, there's a range of of square footages for you know the one bedroom apartments and. Um, uh, we're not uh, okay. We're not making the public housing units smaller. Let me just say that. Okay, they will be they will be um, uh, 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 spread along the different floors in the different unit types. Uh, they will be one bedroom, but they will be larger than the the one bedroom units in the Perlman building. Okay, one other quick question and just a short answer. Originally, I thought you said this new building, the estimated cost would be somewhere around 60 million. So now with the reduction, what did you save in the cost or is it still gonna be the same? I can't answer that question. I'm not sure if anybody on the call can answer that question. I mean, we, we, we haven't had revised construction numbers yet. Yeah, great. We don't have that from our general contractor, correct? No, we, we haven't had, we haven't run the numbers yet. Yeah. And who is the general contractor? Uh, McHugh and Boa. And later, can you provide phone numbers to get in touch with them? Um, well, we'd, we'd rather uh, respond to your questions through the Housing Authority, uh, if that's OK. OK. And just one other question. You said that you're going to be larger because of COVID-19 and because of some preferred tenants who want larger units. Who are uh, these? I didn't say that. I did okay, not say that. I, I did not say that the, I said that in the post COVID era, uh, tenants generally speaking are preferring, preferring larger units. Okay. Um, and, and not as much common area space because they, okay. They, okay. Uh, and so that is the reason why we're making units bigger. Okay. And that, that will, that benefit will flow across all the tenants of the Emerson. Thank you. That's the last of my questions for now. I'll contact you or the city if I have, or my alderman if I have other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Marsha, I think you got my chat. If you come up with other questions that you need help with, you know, feel free to send me an email. Thank you. All right, Council Member Kelly. Thank you. Um, can you go over the number of affordable units and the different AMI um, for those units? Uh, yes, so um, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we have 34, is it 34 um, um, uh, that will actually be public housing units that will be at 50% AMI or less. So this is actually a lower AMI than the um, inclusionary housing ordinance uh, threshold of 60% AMI. Um, and then we will have 17, what we're calling missing middle units. And the AMI there, the, mag, the high, highest AMI uh, allowed in those units will be 80% of uh, area median income. Thank you. And what percent of the 34 that's at 50% AMI, what percent is one bedroom and what percent are two bedrooms? All of the public housing units, all the affordable units are one bedrooms. And how many two bedrooms are there in the market rate? 
or the 80%, the 80% of the market rate. Okay, so uh, so the missing middle units will also all be uh, one bedrooms. So those 17 units will be one bedrooms. The okay. 34 public housing units will be one bedrooms. Um, Greg, how many um, two bedrooms do we have in the building? I'm trying to pull that up right now, actually, sorry. Um, I'm like two per floor or something it. like that? I think it is two per floor or two or three. I'm, I'm trying to pull it up right now and I can answer that in just a second. Hey, this is Sarah Wick. There, there are 42 two bedrooms. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. Sarah. 42 two bedrooms of which not a single one is an affordable unit, correct? Correct. Thank you. And can you tell me when did you do this renewed, this revised parking study? When did you care, when was the study carried out? Uh, well, we, we, um, uh, I meant traffic, I meant study. traffic study, I meant traffic. Study. Yeah, it's both a traffic and parking study. We, we, we contacted our, um, our, our traffic and parking consultant the day after the public meeting when we promised to look at this again. And, um, um, uh, you know, they couldn't just do it, drop everything and do it. Um, they did do it quickly. And like I said, I have a cop, a draft copy. I have to review it first and, and house authority has to review okay. it first and then we'll be happy to share it with the city. Right, but I still don't understand what the date was when you when that was carried out. Well, the date on the memo is September 29th, 2021. So I know, but when was it carried out? I just like, when did they perform this the study on traffic and parking? In the last two weeks. So there was a study done um, between September. Can you just give me a date range? So I, I just wanna be able, because obviously we had concerns about when the traffic study was initially done, you know, during a period of time when Northwestern students weren't here and COVID. So, so if yeah, you could just I'm, give me the I mean, date, I, a range. I, all I can do, all, um, uh, all the person is to tell you, I can tell you the date when I signed the work order. Uh, they may have started working on it before I signed the work order. I'd have to go get the work order. I don't have it in front of me, uh, but it was, the work was done within the last two weeks. So the work was done in September, the, the traffic September, September of 2021, the work was done. Oh. All, all the updates were done in September of 2021. And updates meaning they actually, in, during this month, there, was, there were new studies, people went out and actually carried out traffic studies during the month of September of this year. I believe so. I haven't read the whole report because I just got it about an hour uh, before the meeting started. He, he promised to get it before the end of the day today and actually he got it done a little earlier. I haven't read the whole study. My understanding was that they were gonna take new traffic counts because they took traffic counts in the old study uh, during the summer. And that was um, a, a, um, an assumption that we challenged and they agreed to, to revise that. So I'm presuming that they took new traffic counts. I'd have to okay, read this. Well, I, I think that it's important that we have some you know, concrete information about this before we proceed. Um, and also I have a question regarding the, doesn't our IHO, isn't there a certain, isn't, aren't the affordable units supposed to reflect to some degree um, the proportions with regard to market rate units? I mean, Megan, isn't that, I mean, that there's not a single two bedroom, I, doesn't that fly in the face of our inclusionary housing ordinance? If I could say something on this, um, since this will be an age-restricted building, um, um, there is not a presumption that there will be families in, in the building. And so the two bedroom units will really be a luxury for uh, people to have extra space, to have a home office or whatever. And we just did not think that that was consistent with um, um, you know, the, the provision of, of affordable housing. Uh, but I think it doesn't meet, I think our requirements would mandate that um, a certain percentage of those would have. To the extent possible, the affordable unit should match what is within the building. Um, like Sarah would probably be the, the better person to, to really expound upon that, but she did review what was offered both in the original plan and in this uh, particular update. And she was okay with what was provided, I think, right. in part due to the, uh, the age restriction and possibly some but other. I think it has to be pointed out, nevertheless, that it does not meet what is asked for in our inclusionary housing ordinance, and this should be stated. So, 
Council Member Kelly, that um, that is a perfect example of something that's probably more within the council's purview than the staff's purview. So um, we, we review, as you know, for completeness of application and um, technical aspects of the project. Uh, but that is this will go next to the plan commission and then um, they'll make a recommendation uh, in support or denial of the major adjustment to the city council and planning and development committee and will make the ultimate decision. So I think that's. Okay. Those are kinds of issues that you should bring up when it comes Absolutely. to- Absolutely, but Johanna, we rely on staff to bring the facts forward to the public and not to say simply, oh, this meets our inclusionary housing ordinance, when in fact it doesn't. We don't want you to tell us which way we should go. We just want you to present the facts. And I think that is a fact that needs to be presented to the public. And I, Megan, with all due respect to say that this just a blanket, this meets the inclusionary housing ordinance is not quite accurate. And it doesn't because you know it is supposed to um, reflect to the to the best possible, and that should be stated. Um, the proportion of units that are two bedrooms should also be reflected with regard to the. the now it's okay. Again, we can vote to your point, Johanna. Um, Plan commission, um, P and D can vote along with it, but the staff should inform the public accurately that in fact our inclusionary housing ordinance would require. Um, a proportional number of two bedroom units to re be reflected in the affordable units. Um, if I so, could. All right, so I'm going to ask, you know what, everyone, I'm going to ask because we're running, we're about to run out of, and there's one more applicant too. Um, so I'm going to ask if there's any further um, staff comments or any other members of the public that would like to provide any comments to raise your hand or send me a chat. Um, and then uh, and then if there's any final comments from the applicant, we'll go from there. So and then, I would, um, just, oh, sorry. And then I would just add that um, Councilmember Kelly, we put all of our comments and information into a staff memo that goes to the Planning Commission. So this feedback gets get travels with the project. So okay. I'm Thank sorry, Laura, I, I interrupted you. Thank you. Um, I would actually like to, because in the interest of time, and I know we're losing people and it's disrespectful to 717 Main Street if we don't hear their case, um, I would like to make a motion for a positive recommendation to the Planning Commission. Second. All right. Uh, Katie, please call the roll. Did we lose Katie in all this? No, I'm here. <laughs> um, Knighton. Aye. Jones. Aye. Griffith. Aye. Schnur. Aye. Um, I did see uh, Member Kano arrive on the previous agenda item, so Kano. Aye. Biggs. Aye. Tristan. Aye. Bonetta. Aye. Eckersburg. Aye. Aye. Hank. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right, next item. Uh, 717 Main Street recommendation to zoning administrator. Adil Ahmed Mohammed, potential lease C, submits for an administrative review use for the ground floor medical office for a COVID testing facility in the B2 business district in Dempster, Maine Overlay District. Uh, is the applicant still here? Yes, I am. Thank you for hanging in there. Uh, Thank, welcome you to Thank you guys for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Hope everyone's having a good evening. Um, so um, essentially the plan for this uh, space is to set up a um, free COVID testing facility for the residents of the city of Evanston. Um, we have existing locations around the Chicagoland area, um, about four existing locations in various cities, and this location kind of um, uh, uh, spread out as within the, uh, the nearest two to four mile radius, um, uh, this type of um, absolutely free uh, uh, COVID testing facility, both for PCR and rapid isn't available. Um, we are approved through the CLIA and have a lab in LSIP. Um, rapid tests um, usually occur um, within uh, results within five to 10 minutes of taking the test and the PCR tests are within 24 to 48 hours of the patient taking these tests. 
Um, the biggest uh, question that we had during this uh, during this proposal was the parking situation, where um, there was a, a total number of seven parking units required for. Well, sorry, a total of seven parking units yes, required sir. for this space. No, 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 and he does know the cost of the reduction. And Sorry, guys. Um, uh, so, a uh, total number of seven parking units required for the space. One um, uh, space is has already um, been a part of this unit itself, um, and uh, our neighbors across the street uh, from Goods Farming uh, are willing to lease us six additional parking spaces for uh, this use. Um, uh, this is a, a very <laughs> Uh, non uh, 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 schematic drawing of, of what this space would look like um, and what our waiting areas would look like as well as uh, what those testing tables would look like. Um, everyone within um, uh, who uh, enter the space are would be required to wear facial covering and if they don't have one one would be provided to them the tester themselves would be wearing a n95 um, and all of the seating arrangements in the waiting area um, are pertained to be six feet apart from each other following the cdc guidelines every uh, single after once every single test is performed each testing area would be dis disinfected and cleaned. Um, and yeah, looking forward for any other questions. All right, are there any questions from staff? I will make a motion for a positive recommendation to the zoning administrator subject to the conditions outlined in the memo that was provided by the zoning administrator. I'll second. Katie, please call the roll. Knighton. Aye. Jones. Aye. Griffith. Aye. Schnur. Aye. Kano. Aye. Biggs. Aye. Tristan. Uh, Tristan's absent from this vote. Vanetta? Aye. Eckersberg? Aye. Hank? Aye. Motion carries. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody. I don't think we have any more items, right? I'm not going to miss something. Okay. Thank you. Uh, great. Well, this is the longest dapper meeting I think we've had in a year and a half. So thank you all for your time. Uh, you yes, thank you. Motion to adjourn. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Cut no, cut me off. Cut me off. <laughs> Second. Off. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there a dapper next week? I yes. was just about to tell you that there was a dapper. I know, I realized that after I opened my mouth. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for your time today. It was a long one. Thank Have a good you. rest of your day. <laughs>